Hey there, everyone. Today I'd like to answer a common gripe regarding James Joyce's Ulysses, which is that he intentionally obfuscates the reader, indeed wishes to make a joke at the reader's expense by disregarding the needs of the reader, by adding in all these allusions, all of these experimentations that just make it impossible to be able to situate yourself. And I think this is an important concern to address. So here I'd like to at least make a case for maybe even if you tried to read Ulysses before and just thrown it aside as, you know, hype without any substance. I'd like for you to at least try to understand the appeal that I see in the work and some of the ways that I run into this concern myself and been able to contextualize it and think about how actually that is the point just on the precipice of the wonderful opening of consciousness that is the work of James Joyce. Now, any reading of Ulysses would be incomplete without understanding some of the goals that Joyce has in mind when he's writing this sprawling, encyclopedic novel. The encyclopedic novel is a style shared by works such as Herman Melville's Moby Dick or Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow. So works such as these are basically going to be taking the entire cosmos, a variety of domains with all variations of existential concern to us, and condensing them all into a small package. I mean, small relatively. Many of these novels tend to be, you know, a good 700 pages or so. And as such, you're naturally going to run into a bit of a harder time than you would just your average light reading. These books are supposed to be read over and over, and they're supposed to house within them the variety of meanings that one can pull from the world. The world is one of the densest conglomerations of different objects and concerns and processes and events. And one has to make sense out of it. And one is not going to be pandered to in that exercise. And in the same way, Joyce is going to deliver all those to us, but he's actually going to be much more helpful than the average wayfarer in the world, because he's going to make more explicit than they would in everyday life, fun little links between different phenomena, motifs and themes that are explicated which, with much more clarity than they would in everyday life. And as a result, Joyce is basically presenting a world of its own which mirrors ours in various regards. And as such, it is going to reward methodical, careful, and repetitive exposure to the text. And that's an important thing to note, which can be startling about Ulysses, is that it does take multiple readings. Whether this is going back and reading words in order to know how to pronounce them, sentences in order to understand the cadence, paragraphs in order to understand what the heck you just read, whole episodes in order to understand what the heck you just read. It requires doing that. And it requires going back and reading the book again. Because just like life, there's tons of stuff you miss the first time. But by relinquishing your need to be in control of your reading experience, you allow Joyce to go to the edge of what's possible in language and give you some interesting food for thought. And an important thing to note is that Joyce is not just concerned with semantics, which is to say he's not just concerned with presenting you a word which has a meaning and then you grab that meaning and interpolate it. That's not at all what's happening. In fact, 
Joyce makes a text come alive such that it hits you. It pelts you with confusing words, with strange forms of experimentation that you haven't been exposed to before. And by doing so, shows you're not in control of your reading experience. And that's a profound situation to be in. It is unsettling because you feel out of your depth. You feel like you're, indeed you will be, as I still am to this day, lost in a sea of illusions, all of which you cannot hope to understand transparently and fully. And that's okay. These novels, like Ulysses, or Moby Dick, or Gravity's Rainbow, they are filled with so many references that they can satisfy a lifetime, and furthermore, they can satisfy a lifetime of completely different readers who bring totally different assumptions and frameworks to the text. And as such, you can find your own unique understanding of the text which is both in line with the interpretations of other readers, but takes into, this, takes into account the individual subtleties that you bring as a reader. And one of the cases where the apparent obfuscation of the reader is actually part of the point is the 14th chapter of Ulysses, Oxen of the Sun. In this chapter, we start and basically proceed through a history of the English language, starting from early sort of very crude translations from Latin, all the way up to modern Dubliner slang and shorthand. And when you get to about the last, you know, four or five pages of Oxen of the Sun, it becomes almost completely incomprehensible, especially if you're not from Dublin and you aren't already familiar with some of the slang. And that's part of the point. Even when you start the very beginning of the chapter, the translations, or you know, this, this is emulating what a Latin translation would be like, is so crude and so outside of our normal linguistic milieu that it intentionally pushes the bounds of what we're used to. It forces us to think about, for example, the Latin roots of many words we take for granted. And as we progress into the middle of the chapter, we're like, okay, this is where I'm at home. But then when Joyce pushes us to the limits with this modern slang, he forces us to reckon with our limits and in so doing, reflect on these limits such that we think, hmm, is Joyce trying to, I don't know, make a commentary about the obfuscation of meaning in the modern era due to the saturation of information through media? Like, like, like something like that. Is he trying to actually make me reflect on feeling obfuscated? in order to deliver the feeling that can't just be gleaned through semantics, but has to be embodied as an affective experience. So Joyce is going to push you to the limits as a person. Indeed, this is the case with, for example, the third episode, Proteus, which really embodies the stream of consciousness style that Ulysses is so famous for. In this style, we are exposed to the thoughts of Stephen Dedalus without the mediation of typical, typical markers like he said blah blah blah, or even the manner in which he said it. It's not he said so exuberantly or defiantly. No, it's just thoughts. And furthermore, we can't tell the difference between a perception and an internal thought, so to speak. And indeed, the difference between these is purposely obfuscated to show our immersion in the world, the way in which we actually interact with the world, which is not from the perspective of, you know, a typical novel where you have a narrator who's sort of omnisciently taking you through the day. No, you're stuck in the world. You're indeed often rather outside of your depth, which is taken to quite interesting um, conclusions in Proteus because we are on the Sandy Mount Strand, a bay, 
and he's thinking about the water. So we're quite literally going out of our depth. But because we lose all the typical temporal markers of how fast are events preceding one another, or is this a flashback? We lose all those markers that make us feel at home, like we can breeze through reading. And it forces us to slow down and really think about these aspects of consciousness, of perception, about affection that we tend to take for granted. And once again, we are able to experience the affect he's trying to transmit that would only be able to limitedly be understood through sheer semantics. So I want to press once more that Joyce is not making a joke about his readers. In fact, usually he's making a joke and the reader's job is to join in on laughing at that joke with Joyce. We're on the precipice of, I don't know, World War II and things like that, where a lot of changes are going to be happening such that culture starts to not take itself so seriously. We start to, I don't know, laugh at these notions of grand narratives and, you know, of the concept of history with a capital H. It's famously said in Ulysses that history is a nightmare from which we're all trying to awake, right? So it's sort of like we're just reflecting and through this critical project, some things become funny. And the reader's job here, this is such a big thing as a reader who gets to the point where they feel out of depth. You can have the response of throwing down the work and you can say, this is too hard the author should have done a better job. Or you can say, this is too hard. I should do a better job of slowing down, of annotating more clearly, of talking about this with others, of doing lectures on it and teaching it to other people as a way to learn it. Two very different ways to approach a text. And considering the limited attention span, of the modern reader and the need for constant stimulation. Sometimes Ulysses is going to feel like a slow burn and it's going to make you feel out of your depth because you usually don't have to focus that hard today. So I encourage you to meet Joyce at his project. Instead of assuming that his project is beyond you, Assume that you are just on the precipice of making some fantastic discovery, of being itself, opening up as a Lichtung, as Heidegger says. And in so doing, you will see the true magic of James Joyce's Ulysses. So that being said, I hope this has been helpful. Check out any of my other lectures I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, gender theory, postcolonial studies, and other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom, which you can tailor to your needs. I also have super thanks available if you want to donate to the channel because books are not cheap, but I love talking about them with you. And speaking of books, I have a Heidegger Being in Time reading group, which is going to be starting June 21st of 2024. So feel free to join in and see the videos that I've done detailing our reading schedule. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you in another one.